This Pick conference will now be recorded. Uh, whoops. <laughs> whoops. Um, and uh, we could pick a time and come over and meet you at the fire station or something. Let me know the time and and that, and I will be there. Okay, let's. Uh, Rolly, how's how's your schedule? Or maybe what maybe what we'll do is, Ron, I'll put it back on you to see if you can get us coordinated at a time so we don't take up everybody else's time while we try to find yeah, a time. Yeah, I'll do that. I mean, next Monday night sounds good to me at six o'clock. I mean, we've set a date real quick here. Yeah, yeah, right. We can. That's your hearing. It'd be five o'clock probably. Uh huh. Five o'clock, probably six o'clock. The, the warned hearing for your town meeting day is next Monday at six, so you have to start that at six. But you could start with Brad at five thirty or five fifteen or something. Uh, hell no. Uh, Wait till Tuesday, later. Brad. How rolling? What's up next Tuesday. Next Tuesday. That's fine. Okay. Wait a minute here. Six. Six o'clock. Yeah. Next, next Tuesday. That's the uh, 23rd. Yep. Uh, okay. Uh, at what time? Six o'clock. Six o'clock at the fire station? 23rd at six o'clock at the fire station. Okay. You got it. And, and anybody that would like to join us, come, you know, come join us. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody. I'm going to come down the set and come in more the merrier and um, you know, we might have some other questions that would be nice to put out there too yeah you have to i don't I, i'm i'm cautioning you on the uh, the how many current, right. the current policy of not having meetings <laughs> face to face you'd have to figure out how to do that in the fire station somehow and um if you're going to have multiple board members there it's a public meeting etc cetera, etc cetera. we can add two right uh, committees of committees of the whole are still subject to public meeting rules it's it's really the public being inviting the public and how they are supposed to participate or not it's kind of a general discussion i don't almost don't think it's a it's not necessarily a personnel type thing that you go in executive session it's really about structure and how yeah, he's going to do yeah. so you can you can schedule a meeting i can still open it up virtually so that the public can participate and you could restrict it to just the board members and Brad. but you need to you need to have the virtual option because you don't want 50 people showing up at a meeting but, but I, I think some of this will be going into executive session yeah i know but we still have to set we have to start it with the public like we right. do most meetings, you, right. know, you, you can have to start it in public and then move to executive. Yeah. Okay. And, and with with COVID, I still have to make sure that we're doing the the virtual option. Right. Right. So, not quite back to the old days yet. <laughs> sure. I'm going to be well, so I old by the time we get to the old days, I won't remember. <laughs> I can meet with him and um, bring it back to you, the board. Yeah, that that's another option. Just send just send Roland to meet with Brad and then report back to the board. That's sort of a administrative thing where Brad, uh, Roland's going to bring the you know suggestions for you know responsibility changes back to the full board. It's, well, you know, yeah, and yeah, and then maybe um, I can I can I can send. Um, Roly, I can I can send you or anybody can maybe we, maybe we do it through Ron. Just questions that we might have for Brad, right, right, and suggestions we might have for folks that might want to participate in different ways. Just email them to me and I'll ask. You, you know, if uh, I can make, if I can make a suggestion here, it should be two board members. The, uh, things are said and things are uh, rule ground rules are laid down. It's not going to be he said she said sort of thing. You got three people there, and you're going to be better off in the meeting. Well, it should be the chair then. Yes. Okay. I think we can set six feet apart with the three of us. 
Yeah, I, I was going to say, yeah, I think that, that, that those rooms are definitely big enough. Okay, so we'll just, Roly, you and I will get together with Brad and if other people have questions or things, send them to Roly or myself and and uh, and and then that will be, let's see if that's the 23rd, then on the following Monday, we can, um, we can formalize whatever we come up with. Right, right. right. Okay, sounds like a plan. Um, Thank you. We'll see you then, Brad. Congratulations. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Let me. Um, Ron, is the is the rest of the board aware of the fact that we have had a grievance filed? And that's why we have Tim. Uh, no, I just got it this afternoon. So why, why don't we? Okay. Put that on the table and we can entertain him so he doesn't stay here much longer i see mark's still on the phone line too right right um so anyway ron you want to tell him what and I, th I think what we'll just do here is go over you know we have the we know we have the grievance um i got a couple of things we need to talk about in executive session but just sort of beginning the process of, of uh, having a grievance and what it's about. And uh, and then yeah. I'd probably, Ron and Tim, if you can lay out sort of the time frame that we need to do things in, that would be helpful to me. Yeah, without without getting into the specifics, uh, Tim, do you want to you want to go over what you have to say and then I'll listen in and add if, add if I see any need to add what what you see is the process. Uh, we're 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 well in the uh, I believe both steps. This could possibly be we're at a step two. I'm not quite sure. We didn't talk if it hit step one totally, Ron, through Mark and yourself. Yeah. So when I was reviewing the contract today, it looked like there's a step one, two, three, four process. Correct. They, the grievance document says step one. Uh, that step one is the filing of the grievance. The grievance has to be submitted within 10 days of the event, which it was, um, is, is about a week or so. So it's under the 10 day limit for the employee to file it. Uh, from this point, we have to respond to the grievance, you know, the, the union employee that filed it. We The town has to respond back so it, it, it implies that somehow we have to, before we get to step two, the grievant, which is the employee, has to, has to get a response from the supervisor. So the step one is about the immediate supervisor. The immediate supervisor has to respond to that person with an answer. That person has to say whether the answer is good enough or not. If it's good enough, we're resolved and we, we're done. If it's not good enough a response from the super immediate supervisor, then we go to step two, and that's where I have to address it and do the same process over again. So I don't, I don't think we can skip to step two unless we hear from the employee. <laughs> I'm trying to think. Uh, so has the uh the grievance spoken to the direct supervisor uh, they've spoken but i don't believe that they've spoken but i don't believe the supervisor has given a answer a written you know a written answer on this form yet because we just got the form so i i can help him fill, fill that out and then we'll get an answer on whether it's acceptable and then then miss then the, the grievance can file a step two grievance if they want to if they're not happy and then yeah, i'll deal with it i think where because the rest of this will have to go is you've got uh the grievance and then the settlement requested and the individual yeah, have fund, to. so uh and ryan is actually the designate steward also so basically today, I think at the point now as you guys go through with mark or whatever an executive session and figure out if you want to have respond. Right. Mm -hmm. Basically, I don't think I've got any input other than this at this point. 
for yeah i don't i don't want to skip any spots to get to step two you know we can talk about it generally but we want to finish step one first and i and we don't have um we've got your signature on the step one grievance but we don't have michael oh sorry yeah, <laughs> everybody was off today i didn't realize today was a day off yeah but... so so let's think... let's 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 back let's let's get back to the process just let everybody know it was filed we have some paperwork to do we'll get you updated next week at the yeah. at the next meeting of the select board okay that sounds good i, I think that's what the only yeah, I think so. it'll it'll either be resolved or i'll have some questions for the select board <laughs> sounds very good thank you everybody have a good evening and Good luck with the snowstorm. More snow. <laughs> Yippee. Yeah. Okay. Um, we got here the protocol for work at home and working with vaccinations, a draft policy discussion. Okay. I got this on the big screen. Okay. Put this over here. Okay. So, Ron, you want to walk us through it? Yeah. So there's there's a, what what I found when I started looking at this, other than my own situation, is that mo a lot of towns and municipalities and workplaces are coming up with uh, the um, you know kind of the moving target of between. What, what this means for business, what it means for internet security, what it means for a lot of different areas. So the policies that are being written are trying to deal with all that. Whereas before COVID, there were very few policies dealing with work at home, uh, working remotely, uh, virtual meetings and all that business. So if this, if this pandemic continues or if it ends and starts another incident, it'd be good to have Hyde Park kind of something in writing so that everybody understands what it means and that our systems that we use are good systems so that the the town records and things are not at risk. So in the packet tonight, we do, there was the first cut at the policy, uh, basically a work from home protocol, it's called. There's some there's a cybersecurity handout which goes over some of the issues related to remote working. And then there's some best practices from VLCT. So it's not all that complicated, but I tried to I tried to keep the Hyde Park draft to one page and just looking for input as we go uh, from from anybody or from the public that uh, wants to look at it. And then at some point adopting the policy to have it on the books. One thing that I'm uh, <clears throat> little concerned about is security I think and it addresses it some in that policy um, what happens if um, there's a breach through one of uh, the town employees who's held liable for that breach anything work related is covered by the town's insurance for cyber um, they have malware coverage virus coverage with all of that stuff the insurance company expects us to be doing sort of due diligence, if you will, on making sure that we're up to date software, make sure we have malware protection, make sure we have all those things in place. So the select board talked about in the budget process, trying to upgrade systems with tech group this year. Um, part of that upgrade will happen July 1st, and then the other half of it will happen July 1st, 2022. Uh, when those are in place, We'll have a really current active training system as well as the, all the protective measures that an insurance company will want to see that we're doing before they pay a claim. So basically what you're talking about in, in the sense of a loss is either recreation of data that wasn't saved properly or you're talking about um, extortion type stuff where somebody wants $5,000 before they'll you know, unlock your files. So the things that we've already put in place over the last couple of years get us to a good place. I mean, we have we have the regular monitoring and backup. Uh, we need to do a little more, which is what that tech group proposal was all about. 
um, then we should we should be there. There's there's almost there, I won't say there's never an end to it, but we'll have a pretty good, robust I guess response to those issues. And if worst case scenario happens, uh, whether it's a stolen laptop or you know a damaged server potentially due to some crime, you know those are those are insurance issues that VLCT has a whole. I think it's about 50 pages long on what they what they will and won't do. So I, I think from a from a moving forward perspective, if DLCT were to look at our suite of protective measures potentially at some point when we have them completed, that they could advise us better if there's anything that that else they would recommend. They do have loss control experts that are sort of on top of this that could fill some gaps either with policy changes or with additional training or recommendations for you know security software so i don't think it's ever going to end i think every year that goes by there's going to be a new another wrinkle that we have to deal with um, ipad security for example when you have your town issued ipad at home that's a pretty secure device just because it's an ipad um, this email system is relative I, I think it's relatively secure because we're running that through the server, which is managed by Tech Group. So if we were using some other email system that wasn't through our own server and it wasn't through Tech Group's hands, then I'd be more concerned about the, um, the email system. But one piece that we haven't been good with is really the training part. We've had some soft training, if I would say, where we've advised employees to go online and, and go through a video webinar on phishing and malware and don't click on links. Uh, but that's not developed into a very good program right now, you know, so to speak, where every year we have somebody watch that 30 minute video just to remind them that it's important. The biggest link and the biggest weak link is always going to be the employee. Uh, you know, you checking things out or going someplace they shouldn't go. Yeah, the state mandates that for myself as well, so I have to view it. I think it's good for everybody. Yeah, no, I, I, I think the town is in, is in good shape. I don't, we're only going to get better, I think, and part of that is the employee training piece, which is part of the tech group package that you all looked at um, last fall. I was just wondering how do we link uh, uh, remote working with current job descriptions? Yeah, you don't have to have the link there necessarily. I think you have to, in your policy, you can identify the positions that are eligible for remote and positions that are not eligible, for example. Uh, as it currently sits, I, I almost think everybody is remote to a certain degree. You know. For example, I have on my cell phone, my you know, a couple email addresses. One of them's my work email. So, so technically speaking, that's a remote device where I can remotely access email from wherever I am. Now, do you want that remote uh, capability on a personal cell phone, or do you want to issue work cell phones? That's another discussion companies have because there's there's a control issue. By me having work email on my personal phone, technically I think all activity on my phone is public to a certain degree. So it's harder to unwind those things <coughs> if your device is public and you're still using it for private purposes. But I think almost everybody does right now with the town. I don't, I'd have to check, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that a lot of employees have some access to email. Uh, whether it's general email or you know personal email on their cell phones, and we don't necessarily have a good policy on that. So that, and then there's the remote person that's working outside of the office or even within town, but not in a town office. So you could have somebody that's you know remote, not in town. You could have somebody that's remote um, within the town. You could have short term you know deals where somebody's allowed to go for only a certain number of days and of course you can prohibit uh out of state you can pro prohibit out of country you could you know even if they're remote within vermont so there's all just things that everybody's trying to talk about at once uh, of course melanie who works for uh, my wife who works for uvm she has to deal with this all the time because uvm has people that say i live here but i work there 
students that are in Burlington went home for COVID and now they're doing, you know, some some teacher assistant work in New York. And she's, you know, and this is something that Ali would would need to be aware of. There's tax implications in every state. So if you allow people out to one state, there's not a big deal. If you allow people to work out to another state, it could have tax implications that the town of Hyde Park needs to deal with as well as the employee. So it's not as simple as saying uh, work in Vermont it's, or work in you know, New England states. Every state has something different um, depending on where you're you know, physically working. Some places don't care. Some places, as soon as you step foot in the state, you're supposed to be paying those taxes in that state. So I think there's a lot of discussion to be had on just the whole concept. And like I said, a lot of people are doing it, but a lot of people are also drafting policy at the same time because it wasn't something they had to think about before. Here's a, and not, not thinking of anybody that's, not thinking of any employee now, but um, <laughs> in the in the old system where everybody came into work and you sit in your office you know so and you put in your however many hours a week you're supposed to put in 40 is a nice round number um you see, even though there's no guarantee at how productive anybody was in those 40 hours you feel you have the false sense of an employer of security of the person is there for 40 hours um when you're working at home, you don't um, you don't have their, that security. And as I say, I think it's a false sense of security because just somebody sitting in an office doesn't mean they're being productive. So it would seem to me that 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 could imply. But then, how do you measure it? That your job descriptions and what so you want you want somebody to do need to be really clear because you just don't. I don't. You know. Um, Ron, you've as long as I've been on the board, you're you seem to be 24/7. I don't, I, I've never not sort of almost immediately gotten a response from you. Um, and and during the week when I want anything from Ali, that's uh, that's always been really fast. So I'm not, um, I'm just sort of I'm thinking of the bigger issues that that the change in the world of work is coming up with, and how do you how do you address that? I'm sure they're going to come up with systems that, if you will, there's a way you clock in. But even when you clock in, that doesn't, as they say, I, the false sense of security of having somebody in a room in a building is is exactly yeah. that. Well, it's it's in, it's interesting watching um, Melanie. Of course, we work side by side, and I can see the UVM, which is way more developed than Hyde Park probably will ever be. But there's posted hours where she's available to anybody whether it's upper administration lower administration they log in they sometimes they call first sometimes it's a direct video call you know sort of a surprise call if you will a lot of times there's a courtesy email or a phone call saying hey i'm gonna log in and talk to you in a couple minutes you know get in front of your screen or you know get put, put a hat on your head or whatever so there's kind of a this sort of a built-in protocol if you will with the the line is open right and then the line is closed so the, the accessibility issue is broader to a certain degree for people that log in to a virtual employee uh and easier than it is for somebody to try to hit the nine to four monday through thursday window sometimes so anyway that was just one little one little difference there where somebody's accessible and you in the policy say Yep. Yeah, we hired you for nine to four Monday through Thursday, and that's your hours when you need to be, you know, green or available or whatever you want to call it. Um, if you're logging out, then you know, tell tell somebody you're logging out and you're not available, just like you would if you went to the doctors during the day or whatever. Um, and then get back to people within 12 hours or 24 hours. Come up with a response time for any kind of which we. Generally, we're trying to get back to people, whether it's Kim, Ali, me, uh, Mark French, even everybody's trying to get back to people relatively quickly, but we don't have a standard for that. So in your policy, just to build level of comfort, you would say, 
uh, all employees should get back to everybody within 24 hours. And if it's an internal department thing, make it one hour. You know, but if it's a member of a general public calling, you know, no more than one day is the standard. We don't have those written in, but you could write those into your expectations for response on communication. Yeah, and, and when, we, when we start this, it's going to be a real uh, thought process. Uh, I, I think it's working from home. It's going to change the way we do business down the road forever. You know, if, if people can get their job done at 20 hours a week at home, and I'm just using it, I'm not saying nothing about our employees, if they can get their work done part-time at home, why do we need full-time people paying sitting in the office? And uh, I know this is a, for a fact, because I've seen it myself, and again, not with our company or not with our town, but person working for home, uh, I had to go and do some business with, and when I went to their place of business, they said that person was working from home and I happened to know where that person lived. I said, okay, so I went up to the house and they come around the corner of the house on the lawnmower. Now that, that's not working from home. And, and if I had a question with any business and I walk in the door, I'm getting an answer right then. I, I don't want to wait 24 hours to get an answer. Or I don't want to wait half an hour to get an answer. If they're going to be work for home, they're going to have to punch in at a time and punch out at a time. And if I, you get that question after that time, next day it's got to work, but not during the punch in time. Yeah, that's what yeah. I think. It sort of sounds like like um, Melanie has, like UVM <clears throat> has. Here are the hours that you're, you know, that that you're in. But it, it's also, um, I mean, it's, I think one of the things that's real clear that in many ways. Uh, people can be much more efficient working at home because you don't have the folks um, dropping into chat. Okay, and certainly in lots of offices, but I think particularly a town clerk's office, lots of times folks just drop into chat. You know, um, and you don't you don't have that when people are working at home. So no. I, th I think that's what's going to be interesting, Dave. And I think the whole world is going to be figuring this out. How do you? How do you balance that? Yeah. Because if, it, it, if somebody's more more efficient, um, you know, so if I'm taking my cell phone with me and I'm working at home, but I'm loading up and doing the laundry, so what? You know, you I'm you, you ask me a question and I give you an answer right then. That's the kind of it's. I'm glad I'm not young having to figure this all out. <laughs> well, I mean that's okay if you got the answer, but your your machines, your copying machines, and all your stuff is back at the office. That that's but, right, right. But, which brings another thing on there, and and again, I'm not talking about the town, but not all people's worth ethics are created equal. You know, and that is something you're going to have to uh, to bring out. Like I read your uh, thing that you sent out, Ron, and uh, you know. Uh, uh, if you don't feel good or, or uh, road, bad road conditions or uh, taking care of a family member or something where you said working virtually, well, that's, if we put that into policy, now we've got to start looking at the ETO time. What, what is ETO time and with this policy that, that somebody can say, hey, I'm using that to do this and a month down the road, take off three days on their ETO days when they would have had it if they did what they did previously. So we, we've got to look at that side of it. Yeah, I think part of it is the uh, within the policy, the, having your expectations enforceable. So let's say, let's say you hire somebody for 20 hours and they're tasked with a job that requires public interaction. Mm-hmm. You would want those 20 hours to be open to anybody calling, videoing in, logging. You know, that person could be really accessible, but you need to define the hours. And really, the enforcement part of this is kind of interesting because the system that's used is visible by everybody. So let's say a select board member said, "Well, let's see what uh, you know. Let's see if Rajensky's online or whatever, just for fun." And you log into the system, and you see my green light there, and you know that you could just say hello into your computer, and I'd say, "What's up?" <laughs> you know. So 
It's not but, something. That, but we wouldn't hear a splash, splash, splash when you're going that. No, I'll make sure it goes red. You know. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know. But how do you when you're monitoring that stuff? It, it's it's all new, I guess, is the summary, and it's not that difficult. But you do have to get used to it, and I think overall, I think it improves public access and makes it easier for people. And as people get more, you know, familiar with online resources. Uh, there's going to be some people that won't be up familiar with it, and you're going to have to accommodate those people as well. Mm -hmm. So you do have to be aware that you know going online is not a, a solve all. There's still going to be some hands-on stuff that needs to get done. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and and that'll be as you say, there are copiers and all sorts of things in an office that people are going to need to come in and use and do that sort of work. But it becomes a scheduling. So you. I, I would see, you know, in our small office that you end up with somebody um, picks a day or two days of the week when they're going to when they're going to physically be there the rest of the time they're working. And that's when people will know somebody will physically be in the office at that time. If you if you because and again, because because it's a transition and I think a lot of people could feel, you know, the being able to stop into the town office and chat or just you know, and when you're paying your property taxes or your a variety of things that you're doing, that not not doing that feels feels like less service, even though you you're technically getting everything that you need to get. It, it's gonna it's gonna feel different. I have a question for you. How would your rate of pay? be would it change or you know for a remote position versus an in-office position yeah i think that's part of what we're talking about so when the town sets up its expectations for employees there are certain employees that have right now a salary set up and other people that are wage hourly wage so if if you were to go into a sort of a negotiation of sorts and say okay here's the new deal um you are hired to be in the office four days a week, uh, you know, nine to four. And now you, you're, we're going to renegotiate that so that it's remote. And you'd walk through the pros and cons with everybody, including taxpayer expectations for what they were getting under the old system versus the new. If it doesn't work, then the remote would be denied. If, if it figures out that it can be uh, worked on, then it would be approved the value of the change would be renegotiated as well, I would think, if it's a permanent change to that person's you know, letter of hire or whatever. Uh, and then it's either gonna be more hours potentially, so maybe there's a five-day schedule instead of a four-day schedule, for example, for the same pay. Or maybe it's, you know, remote has a, has a you know, lesser demand. I don't, I, I don't know, sort of like, I'm thinking off the top of my head, Monday through Thursday, nine to four, the green light has to be on 50% of the time, for example, not 100% of the time. You're working, but you don't need to be interrupted while you're working on a policy every, all, right. all the time. So those are, I think those are good questions that just need to be talked about because we don't want to put a situation where people think there's less value and the employee getting more in, in inappropriate pay or something like that, or, or vice versa. It could work the other way where there's more work being done and there's a pay increase needed. So it, it needs to be talked right. about whenever there's a sort of a permanent change. There's always gonna be temporary changes. Um, you know, when I was hired, it was four days a week in the office and I worked the fifth day remotely. So that was, that was back, 2011, I think, is when I started doing that. So I've had my, me, my, for my personal schedule, I've had remote on Fridays and four days in the office, and and sometimes on weekends as remote. So I, I was already set up with the laptop and the phone. So that's where the blurring of the lines can happen too, where you end up with what Susan was saying, where you have like a seven day schedule and you didn't know it, you know. And sometimes that's better, you know. So you know some of some of the questions that end up uh, you know, I've had interactions with taxpayers on Saturday where they were really excited and they needed an answer to help them get through their situation. And saying that the office is closed until Monday at nine was not going to be a good answer. And it was just better to deal with those kind of things whenever they happen, I think. And that's getting back to what Dave was saying. 
you know, if there's a burning issue, it should be resolved as soon as possible. The longer it sits, um, oftentimes the worse it gets. Well, I'd say that the good thing on this is that we are, uh, we don't have to invent it ourselves. We have an entire country and all kinds of businesses and the league and everybody that's working on it. So, so um, I'm sure we'll have a lot of good guidance. There'll be a lot of interesting conversations. It's a, uh, uh, well, yeah. And, and, and it's probably no matter what everybody thinks they've thought of, as soon as you put it in place, there'll be three things that nobody thought of. But. Anybody? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, go ahead. I got a I got a couple of text messages that um, some of the public, including Brad, was unclear if the board was uh, deferring the appointment until um, after that meeting that was going to happen, and which would be deferring it until March 1st. We didn't talk to Ed Webster about whether he would stay on as fire chief. We're kind of in limbo uh, if you if you don't make an action on that tonight. So if you're not ready tonight, then we probably should talk to Ed because you can only have one fire chief. We don't have a process for a um, a nominated fire chief or a uh, chief elect elected chief, you know, like they do for some of those governmental positions, but. Um, sure. He was, okay. He was looking for clarity on it. Okay, Rol Roly, you're you're and everybody else. What would you what would you like to do? I'd... Well, the process was always we always left it when I was on the fire department to the members, and the members have spoke. I, I that's the way I feel. Right. So we do we want to technically go ahead and do it, or wait until after we talk with Brand? I'm I'm perfectly comfortable doing it now. I am too. I am too. Sure. Um, Roger, Dave, Brian, what do you think? No opinion. It's a. <clears throat> yeah. Does the public the... get to ask questions? Yep. I was just wondering, how many hats does Brad actually wear? I mean, is he going to be able to handle, like you said, Susan, is he going to be able to handle being fire chief plus doing fast squad plus whatever else that he does? I know he fills in for the town plowing, too. So I mean, was there other candidates? No, no, this is this is just an election that, that the, uh, the fire department and the members have. And this is who they've elected. But they, again, the questions that we brought up, that that's why we'll sit down and sort out something with the. Uh, with Brad and see what um, see, see which see which hats he wants to get he wants to give up so he's got a reasonable number of hats. Plus, you I you know pragmatically, if anybody in the town wears too many hats, if something happens to that person, you have some real issues. Right. That's that's what I was getting at. That it's realistically, it feels like there could be issues that arise from, from him having too many hats, so. Right, right. and and that's what uh, Roly and I'll sit down and have a conversation with him about it. We'll sort out something and come back. That'll be, it won't be the next one, the 23rd, so it'll be the 1st of March. We'll come back and talk to the board about it. Is okay. there, um, have you heard yeah. from Ed on if he would stay on until you guys were able to talk to Brad? Uh, no, I certainly haven't heard anything from Ed. Well, it went the worse than any other, any other fire department, and I was on the fire department for 33 years. Once that vote was casted to whoever, <laughs> captain or fire chief or assistant fire chief, they immediately took over. So I don't know why we should change things now. Yeah, I don't, I don't I think they're the right. Thing, they had the same thing in Morsel here just a few years ago. Um, you know, I, I know that. And um, the minute the, the fire chief was voted out, which I won't mention no names, walked out of the firehouse and the new guy took over. And that's, that's the way it's always been in, and I've talked to the old fire chief over this weekend just to make sure that Cookie Gray, and he said that's exactly the way it worked way back in the day, back in the 
70s and stuff. So I don't see why we should do that now. Am I still on? Yeah. Yes. Okay, because something happened. My, my thing blanked, and I don't know. I think my concern is right now, and I don't care which way it goes. I mean, Rolla's a liaison. It, it, it's, he should be working on it. But any time I ever seen a split bull, you make half of them happy and you tee off the other half. I'm just wondering if are we going to lose any firefighters on the teed off side? Well, I don't know, but the same thing is happening here with the presidency too. Look what's happening there, but you know it is what it is. I mean, the voters have voted, and, the, and they've done what they wanted to do. So, does anybody know if it was a close vote? Ten, ten, to, ten to seven. Ten to seven. seven. Yeah. Six to seven? Ten to seven. Oh, ten to seven. Um, I just want to make sure everybody's clear on what what's going on. I think the past practice is what Roland has said. Um, the bylaws are where you would get clarification. The bylaws are in the process of being updated. During that process, the state law says that the select board supervises the fire chief. The fire chief supervises everybody else. Um, and the state law also says that the select board may appoint all of the officers in the fire department. So that's a big, that's a big may. Like I said earlier tonight, it's not something that you've done by practice every year. I don't think you'd necessarily want to be um, involved with that of all officers. The fire chief seems to make the most sense to have a discussion with the fire chief from time to time, maybe at the start of every two year term, because it's only a two year term under the bylaws to bring up any issues and whatnot. Uh, maybe it's just a, a discussion um, and, and go along with what the firefighters say, but still have a checkpoint every two years, which will be your every odd year where the select board does bring the newly appointed, whether it's a reappointment or a new face, uh, and have this chat about the whole relationship. So I don't, because of the supervisory duties, I think there should be some something that happens every two years with the fire chief uh, related to the new term. But whatever you want to do with it, it can go from appointment to no appointment, and just going with the with the officer's vote. So you have you have a choice under state law to actually make the appointment final uh, once the election's done. Okay. Could you and Sue meet with Brad sooner than later? Um, um, I could do it probably this week, Wednesday or Thursday, but I know I'm booked tomorrow night and I know I'm booked Friday night. So Wednesday or Thursday, if we could get a hold of Brad, I could do it then if Susan can. Yeah, let me... Let me. But I don't know, understand it. I don't understand this, you guys. I don't understand this. Now we're just talking about the fire chief. Now, the way I understand, there we've got a new assistant fire chief, too. Now, let the process do what the process is supposed to do. In the last 45, 50 years in Hyde Park Fire Department, the select board has never got involved in this. Unless there's, unless there's an issue. And, and you know, I don't think we should get involved in it now. We should sit down and talk with Brad, like we said, and say, Brad, you are wearing too many hats, and he's already agreed to talk to us and yeah. see where we can work out there. I mean, yeah, I, I, you know, the voters I, have voted. Yeah. No, I don't, th I don't think his talk is about whether he's going to be cheap or not. That, that's not the issue. It's right. been voted. The, the, the people, the, the, the audience has spoke. I think just to set some ground rules, what the select board expect out of the new chief. And and that would be fine too. You know, we will discuss that the night that we sit down with him and, and um, you know, and um, we'll, um, you know, try to get him out of some of this other stuff that he's really good in and say, you know, Brad, you've got to pay a little bit more attention now to the, fire chief's part, and, and I do know when I was on the fire department in the fast squad, because I was on the fire department, 
when the fast fog started. And I guess there's no writing about it, but I do know what was said there that night. And if you were an officer on the fast squad, you could not be an officer on the fire department. Yeah. And that yeah. that is that's where we got to start. Yeah, I, th I think that's Roger. You've been quiet. What do you think? Well, the only thing bothers me. The only question I got is back when we uh, did the air pack for the mass and stuff. We were told they had over 25 members. I can't remember, between 25 and 30. And what bothered me, it has only seen like there's 17 people that voted. So well, somebody ain't members. the truth, I would say that. Uh -huh. I would say somebody's not telling the truth about how many <laughs> members there is on that fire department because the, the, the names the, the, down the, on there Names down on there, and half the people are not there half the time anyway. Well, Brad is the one that, that brought that up. That had they had so many people, they needed so many of those filters for those masks, and we ended up voting only half to buy. And now the number comes up that the only people that voted was ten to seven. That's seventeen people. What happened to the rest of the firemen? You know just as well as I do. Were they there, or were they weren't there, or they, or they just haven't got that many people? Well, or they, or they didn't, they didn't choose to participate. There, we have a lot of registered voters in Hyde Park that never show up that's, to vote. That's <laughs> what I would like to know. Yeah. Was it that they weren't there? There's, that that question will be asked the night we meet with Brad. Because we'll God that. was the one that told us that that night. When I asked how many firemen they were, and we decided only buy half the mass for them, to do half of the mass for now, and then we do the other half later on. So that's why that's why I'm confused. Is why, you know, you told you got so many firemen, and you know you're missing eight people according to what we were told. That's what I would like to know when you have your meeting with him. Okay. That question will be asked. That question yep. will be asked, Roger. Okay. Then I'll come back to do. Do we want to go ahead and um, and um, if you will approve him tonight? Even though it sounds to me, even if we don't, he's going to. He's basically stepping it into it anyway, whether we technically do it or not. I would expect. I will make a motion to approve him tonight. Yes. Okay. You got a second? We got got a lot of silence here, Roly. Okay, looking for a second to go ahead and approve Brad tonight. Now I haven't got any idea what to do. You got me. <laughs> there's, there's well, you'll have to either second it or forget it. I'll um. I'm, I'm I'm comfortable. I don't usually think of chairs as seconding, but I'm perfectly comfortable going ahead with it. I think uh, I think I think I have complete confidence that we will sort something out with Brad because I don't think a new fire chief wants to start out with a crummy relationship with the select board. <laughs> Just sort of practicality there. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, we'll see. We'll see what happens if we vote. Okay. All in favor, signify by saying aye. We got two of us. Aye. Aye. Anybody opposing? How about abstaining? Aye. So what? Oh, let's. We got. Who's all right? Let me go with abstaining. Give me a whole wave, right? <laughs> There's some, Brian's abstaining. Dave, abstaining. Oh, oh you're on mute. Uh, you got me between a rock and a hard spot, uh, and I'm, try I'm trying to say this might sound goofy, but without going into session there, there's no question in my mind that Brad Courier could not run the fire department. He's very knowledgeable. He's good at what he does, and that he puts in 110 percent. But there are some questions that I would like to see answered. There's some okay. ground rules that I'd like to see set, and, and there's some transparency issues that we want to get into place going into this so we don't do what we've done 
in the past and, and stumble over ourselves. And that's okay. the I'm my, not looking my, my thoughts exactly. I, I just have more questions, more, and I was hoping that Roland would answer those before I go about making a decision. Well, I think then how about, here's what we'll do. We'll table the motion. Because, and again, it's we're clear, no one has questions about Brad's competency in doing it. Correct. We just want to get the rest of his life sorted out and how that impacts everybody else in the town and make sure that, that, um, Correct. that, we, that we've got it clear. So, and that's, so, that's, that's perfectly okay too. So we'll um, just, and I think, Rolly, let's just stay with doing it on the 23rd. And, and again, if I'm talking to Brad, there isn't any question about his competency at all and that we're going to do this. We would just like additional information before we formally vote to, uh, to, to accept him as chief. How's that? Okay. Yeah, like I said, I just, I just like to have some more information. That's yeah. all it is. And yeah. no, nothing at all wrong with Brad. And nope. Just I want nope. more information. I think, right. I think we're all quite clear with that. So you want us to make ourselves a list and give it to you too? Yeah, that would be great. So when do you want it by? Oh, we got time. Let's have it by Friday. This Friday? Friday. Yep. But where we're, uh, I can't email it to you, but. Oh, that's that's right. Um, just drop it off at my place, Roger. You go by here, just drop it off at my place. Oh, yeah. Well, we're okay. going to have those documents. We're going to have those documents assigned probably tomorrow, too. So he's going to have to stop by to for the uh, certificate of no, I'm violation. Sorry. That, Remember, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry yeah, about that. Sorry. Okay. Can it, I, I can pin it on the board there in the alleyway. Okay. Yep. That'd be fine. Name? Or, or drop it off with Rolly. That would be great. Either way. Yeah. Okay. Let me see. How about how about if we review and approve the town orders? Okay, do folks need more time with the with the town orders or is everybody set? Yeah. I'm all set. I'm all I'm all set. You're good? Roger, you good? I have to sustain because I don't have them. Ah, okay. Um okay, then need a motion <coughs> excuse me, to review and approve the town orders. So move. Second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anybody opposed? And we got Roger abstaining. Okay. Um, next with <coughs> with the with the other business. Um, Roger, have you heard anything from for a next meeting set for the law enforcement study group? We got, uh, I got the, the other thing I got that I uh, stuff the town stuff. I got a list that they made questions that they want to ask Roger and stuff. I mean, I got in the middle of this without kind of blind, uh, and I don't know. I, we were supposed to get back to. Um, a call, but I don't have any way to get back to him. I don't even have his number. So if Frank could call me sometime and give me his phone number so I can talk with Duncan. Mm -hmm. Can do that maybe I can some questions I have. Yep. No, we'll talk. We'll talk tomorrow. Okay. 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 Um. The Gihon Valley Hall Committee got a, um, we, <laughs> my bad, bronze bad, we're all, we blew it. We forgot they had, um, we were going to, we were going to 
put up for town meeting the $1,500 request <clears throat> for, for paying for their broadband access, all that sort of stuff. And we neglected it, so we missed putting it in the um, in the warning. And of course, we don't have anything from the floor. Um, I'm not Ron. What do you What do you think? So the um, the extra fifteen hundred dollars was the about I think it's one hundred and ten dollars a month for their Comcast broadband so they can do Wi-Fi for the events at the Grange Hall as well as I almost think they're trying to get it to go to the street so people could pull on the side of Route 100. So what I was thinking is that because it's a community benefit at least for the 2022 year um, I would look at the community events budget and the administration budget to see if we had the 1500 in there uh, or at least part of it in there and then also work if, if there's some expenses at the Grange that could be done through a small grant or something maybe use the offset for that to cover that so I think it's a it'll be a work in process I don't like I said I think there's money within uh, you know the general administration for IT which we could take it from there or the community events line or just some savings within the Grange. They're doing so many projects. Uh, they just got the 50,000 for windows. They're working on the 10,000 for the electrical fire safety. Um, I don't, I just, I, I think going really slowly with the Grange Hall is probably gonna be needed. So, uh, Roger Audette from this expense to figure out how to pay for it all the way through these projects. Uh, out of the 3,500, I don't know what they were planning on using. So the 3,500 budget has been the same for many years. My first question is to look at the 3,500 to see what's in there. And then from there, working with Liz and Al to figure out how to get the uh, 1,500 covered. Yeah, I think I think they used the 3,500 to match to get the other grants. I'm I'm pretty sure. We'll, we'll double check that, but I think that's what they're what they're doing. But yeah, I think. <laughs> I certainly know in the in the village, the number of people and in the nice weather that sit outside and take advantage of that, you know, boosted Wi-Fi there is is uh, not insignificant. And there was more than one teacher that was, as they were trying to teach their classes distantly, was parked outside the library taking advantage of that because they didn't have it at home. So um, <laughs> there's another whole interesting thing that's changing. Okay, um, remember we've got the next two, I sorry, say two Tuesdays, the next two Mondays um, for informational meetings. Kim's been putting stuff out on uh, on Front Porch Forum. I, I, um, let's see, I'm seeing if I can get something just to have uh, Roland uh, LaJoy announce it in the, uh, you know, in his morning program. I don't know, you know, what else we can do. Um, and Ron, what the, uh, Vermont, the Vermont Arts Council project? Oh yeah. So this is a 2020 grant from Vermont Arts Council for animating infrastructure. Uh, the committee met which is a steering committee that we talked about last year. They are working just, uh, with a finalist, uh, Daniel Gutsigan, and they're planning a site visit within the next week or two, and then a committee meeting to ask some questions before they decide a final answer on selection for that artist. Uh, work would continue through 2021, engaging the <coughs> and looking at the three triangle points uh, of how to connect the rail trail to Main Street. The three points are the existing parking lot on Depot, the West Main Street cross road or intersection with the rail trail, and then Main Street near the courthouse and the sheriff's department near the um, near the new park, pocket park. So expect some good conversation with the public. Dan 
uh, is totally engaged with the community and his other projects. And if you want to see his work, um, I, I had it posted on the home page if you want to see his work, but you can also Google Daniel Gottsegen, which is G-O-T-T-S-E-G-E-N, and check out his work in South Burlington and Colorado and I think down in Barrie. And it's pretty, pretty exciting. It's it, The committee hopes it's something that draws people in, like the painted silo in Cambridge. So that's one of the one of the general goals is to figure out how to how to get people to stop on the rail trail and come up Main Street. And Vermont Arts Concept Brand is all about animating infrastructure to do that. That was loud on the fire time. We had a chimney clean today. This is just getting the stove going, going, okay, all right, quick. My husband starts <laughs> shivering. It's time to definitely put another log on the fire. <laughs> yeah, so we're also um, with the arts. Yeah, we're also with the arts council. Yeah. Uh, we'll get a better time frame in a few weeks, hopefully right yeah. after Tom yeah. Day. We'll have a good good timeline on that project. <clears throat> Okay, highway department update to discuss the road commissioner and the matrix of responsibilities. So <laughs> I have I have a suggestion. Why don't we go back to the way things always used to be and the road foreman is the road commissioner? That's the person who's out. I mean, I think you want a road commissioner that's really knows everything that's going on on the roads. And I think forever it used to be, you know, those your your foreman or whoever you know i don't know what the official titles were but you know was also the the road commissioner if if you went back to the older way so you're going to find out you had a select board member that was a road commissioner then you had the road foreman and uh, i'll put out some name there that, that uh, for years and years and years ken harvey was a road commissioner and years and years and years kenny was a road foreman and I, uh, uh, right now, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, well, and and, and I would say, right, at, at doing it, I don't, as, as the world gets more and more complex, I do not think it's appropriate for a, for a select board member to to be that, that involved with any department. Uh, you know, the roads are our biggest things, but so I, so I don't know how we, you know, I just, we, keep, we, keep, we, keep, we keep seeing to running around in circles on this one, and I'm just trying to figure out how to stop first driving all, in circles. First of all, like I've mentioned quite a few times, is you've got to have a job description. You've got to set that job description so people know what their roles are. And that hasn't been done yet. It's still, it's still in its infancy being developed. You can't you can't just give somebody a role and then have them go out and do it if they don't know what needs to be done and what and then you're gonna get it crossings back and forth and like I said I'm personally getting kind of tired of uh, of expressing that and everybody knows that it's true they need to have a job description they need to know what to do any job that anybody's ever held has a job description for it. We can look at the other towns, and actually Johnson has an excellent, uh, uh, I haven't reviewed it in probably a year or so, but Johnson's got an excellent uh, uh, layout of all their job descriptions right online. And we may be able to, uh, um, instead of rewriting the whole thing, just uh, adopt sort of, of borrow theirs, right. And they just hired a road, uh, they just hired a road commissioner too, right? Correct. Uh, I think they call it a supervisor. I think they call it a little bit, a little bit different. I think it's more like a public works supervisor, maybe. Or yeah, something. public works. Yeah. So the road, the road commissioner title, is is a title in state law where the select board is uh, charged with designating a road commissioner. 
typically that's done in towns that don't have a road foreman. So I think if you look at your statutory duties as the select board, for example, one of those is to make sure the roads are graded and that drainage is working properly. So the Hyde Park Select Board in the past has put the statutory duties, I, I, I believe this is true without, without anybody really knowing it, I think has put the statutory duties of the select board for highway, all of them onto the road commissioner. This might have been when Ken was doing it or when Russ was doing it or whoever was taking on that title. And that person would direct to a high degree work done. So when the road foreman was out there responding to emergencies, less planning. There was less planning of projects. There was less, um, you know, uh, work, so to speak. The road foreman was truly to carry out the direction of the day given by the road commissioner. So if Ken said, well, we're going to go rebuild, uh, you know, some side road, then the road foreman would go out and build the side road or whatever whatever they were directed to do, thinking that it was a directive from the select board. And, you know, from, from practical perspective, I don't believe there was five road commissioners. I think the select board had one person that was called road commissioner. Let's say it was Ken Harvey. And he would work closely with the crew to get work done. Emergencies, on the other hand, if there was snow emergency or a washout, he would probably expect the road crew to go do that. I don't know if he would direct them how to do it. I don't know if he would go to the washout and tell the road crew how to do it, or if he'd expect them to know how to do it so he wasn't worried about it. So the, the road commissioner is really, a, just like Brian was saying, a person in town appointed by the select board with a very specific list of task duties from state law. So state law says, for example, the roads road shall be drained properly and the select board is in charge of that. So I can't read that, but what is it? <laughs> it? It says right here, as you were saying that, it says essential tasks and duties and responsibilities for the uh, for the um, as a job description. Let me see what they call it. Recreational uh, coordinator, but uh, they have it all laid out here. All the work is done, and I can't see where where they'd be too too much difference. It's just some fine tuning. It would have to be done. So yeah, why don't that. why don't that's from Johnson, right? Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you ship that to all of us? Okay. I'll, I'll okay. send the the link here to it. Okay. All right. And um. This is a, we, got, we we got two more Mondays lined up, and I'm going to be amazed if there are hundreds of people asking us lots of questions so you know we may be able to take advantage of you know having put aside that time to to get to uh to finally reach your goal brian mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah so what, that right in the back of your if you don't have it um we do have a road foreman job description so there'd be an overlap yeah. potentially of um johnson's or state law or what you, you want the road commissioner do versus what you want the road foreman to do or the same person or however you however you work on all that stuff if you want to get rid of the hyde park road foreman and call him the road commissioner the job description is probably close to what the road foreman does now for hyde park and there may be some other decision making things that the, the revised one would do or you break it up into two and have a new road commissioner job description and the road foreman job description alongside it. Maybe it's two different people or the same person. I don't I don't know. But just make sure you're looking at the road foreman job description. If you don't have it, I can email it to you. Okay. All right. Uh Roly, I have a question for you actually. Maybe you could answer it. Uh, you used to be the road foreman for Morseville. Did they have a road commissioner or was it were, did you do both jobs? They had a uh, superintendent, which they've gone back to the superintendent now. Um, they got away from that for a long time, and <clears throat> so they went back to yeah, the, the guy who took my place over there is a superintendent now, the way I understand. Okay. And it, 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 and it, does, it does help. It relieves the foreman from a lot of 
tasks of visiting with people, going out and seeing the complaint, and you know that works out great. Of course, they've got two two departments over there, the up there in the village and down the down garage. So there's there's a lot more over there than there is over here, but. Okay. To me, to me the, road, the road commissioner and the road foreman should not be the same person. And I'll, I'll agree with Rolly on that. And I'll give you an example. What I do know is if you have a road commissioner and road foreman, the first that they own. Unmute, uh, you muted I yourself. I missed you. He, he muted himself. He did. <laughs> I can't talk like that. Hello, <laughs> uh, Dave. Yeah, Dave, I can't tell if you're muted or not. Are you? It looks like you're okay, but yeah, I don't know. You you say you're it says you're not muted. There you go. Now you're muted. No, something something went wrong on your side over there. But you can call in if you want. You must Boy, have I've never heard him. That way. Couldn't read it. No, if you Dave, if you want to call in, we'll get you audio on that. The phone number's on the agenda. Susan's muted. <laughs> Dave, do you want to um, log log off and log back in? Yeah, maybe that's what he's doing. While we're waiting for Dave, um, oh, no, he just still doesn't have audio. Okay, um, am I correct to assume? Just from what I know, Wolka also they have a road foreman and a separate road commissioner. Yes, they do. <clears throat> The road foreman, as I said, and the road commissioner should not be the same person. I absolutely agree with you. <laughs> Thank you. Dave, do you want to, I don't know if you can hear me, but you can log off totally or I'll, I'll boot you and you can log back in. Looks like your whole internet is frozen or something. I'm going to dismiss you. Hopefully, you can call back in. <clears throat> okay. And and you know the a road commissioner has got a lot of power too. That's one thing you got to be careful of. Exactly. I'm going to try to call Dave to see if he can get back on. Well, and that's quite as we've heard him in a long time. <laughs> Roly, he agreed with you and his world disintegrated. <laughs> He'd say the same thing about me. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Hello. Hello. There, hear him. Okay. Oh, no. I, I don't know what happened. My, my uh, thing shut down and says meeting in process. I can't get back in. But just to uh, iterate what I was saying is I believe it, it's a good practice to have a road commissioner and a road foreman because if, if somebody has to complain on the road, the foreman is the judge and the jury. He, he He's always going to try to defend himself and I'm not saying about anybody but that's the way it is and it gives hard feelings between the road foreman and the taxpayer or the complainant if you have a, a separate road commissioner where he goes and 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 sees the problem hears both sides of the story then then he can make a, a logical decision and, and I agree with Rowley that that's why Morrisville has has a superintendent and a road foreman because it makes it so hard on the road foreman if he's trying to do his job, say we get this 
foot snowstorm come in and all of a sudden somebody don't like the way the road is plowed or don't say it is plowed or whatever the thing is. Now he, if he don't stop and go to see that person, he, he, he's in the wrong. Or if he does go see the person and argues about it, he's in the wrong. It makes it a lot easier on the foreman. I agree. Okay. Okay. So, so we've, we've got the, uh, the, the links to see what, um let's see let's see if we can manage to finally get the job description and figure out what we want to do and uh our other big goal somewhere along the line should be to finish the rewrite of the fire department things <laughs> jeez um okay 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 i am back hey all right there he is so um we we need um, so retaining the professional services to review the village water and sewer rates. Um, we need to go into executive session to talk about that, um, and we need to go into executive session so everybody's got a heads up on the grievance. And I don't know are there other things that we that we need to do so. We don't keep folks just hanging around for us to come back out of executive session and then do something else. I'll be all right. Dave, you're mu muted. I don't know how we're going to get used to this darn thing. <laughs> <laughs> I said the only thing we got left to do actually in the meeting is just accept the minutes, isn't it? Uh, yep. It wasn't on the agenda. It wasn't on the agenda. <laughs> okay. We'll skip it. Okay. okay. So I guess um, what we need to do is uh, a move to go into executive session. So moved. So moved. Okay. Um, all in favor of going into executive session, signify by saying aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Aye. Anybody abstaining? receive that notice tonight the select board talked about um, Brad in the positions and it agreed to talk to Brad for multiple hats but you're not making a, an appointment because it's a it would be a new action or new practice of the town to vote on the fire chiefs it's not, not gonna on the fire chief you're just accepting the judging uh, the and you're supporting supporting the new person in that position. So technically, Ed is fire chief uh, would end tonight, and Brad's would start tonight because you're making a decision not to act on it. It's a little convoluted, but I, I without something written down, it's you, you wouldn't want to start voting on all the officers without having a good public policy discussion first, which we've never had, which is what Roland's been saying. It, it wasn't done in the past. Right. <clears throat> Okay, so we all have that now that we are going to honor the chairman's Brad will be fire chief tonight. Yes. We got it, yes. A lot of static. I don't know why. Yeah, yeah. Something. Yeah, that, I think that's Mr. Dave. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> Okay, so that's we got anything else? We're good. I think so. We're good. Move to adjourn. Yeah, I'm I'm good with so moved. Got a second? Second.
Okay. All in favor of adjourning, signify by saying aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Okay. Anybody abstaining? Okay. Everybody get ready to shovel. <laughs> have, have fun tomorrow. Good night, everybody. Thank Good night. you. Bye. Ron. Ron. Yeah. If you get yes. a chance, uh, if you if you do any research on that, what we talked about. Yeah, yeah. Let me, let me know, would you? Yep, we can do that. That, that could help us out. No, I appreciate that. Okay. okay. Yep. Okay. okay. Good night, everybody. Yep. Bye. Good night. Better get out.